All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jared Walczak. I'm Vice President of State Projects at the Tax Foundation. I appreciate all of you taking some time out of your afternoon, well, afternoon for most of you, to join this webinar and to participate with us in this conversation about what we're calling the new property tax revolt. Uh, before we get into anything further, I do want to provide a little bit of basic detail about the format. This is in webinar format, so there's an opportunity for people to ask questions throughout. There is a Q&A option within Zoom. Please feel free to use that at any time. We will be taking questions. We may intersperse some of those throughout to the extent that they make sense to take sort of in the stream of this conversation. Others we may take towards the end. Uh, one of the reasons we're using the Q&A format is to maintain privacy. We recognize <clears throat> that there are uh, legislators, legislative staffers, and people from policy organizations on the call. And we do intend to have a recording of this. So we understand that you may want to ask questions and not have it associated with a particular office. That will not be done. These will be private questions that we will answer publicly, but without associating with any individual person or office. Uh, with that said, uh, we want to get started. We want to talk about what we really think is one of the big issues of 2024, which is this property tax revolt. And I recognize that that is perhaps a really strong way of saying this, to say that there is a revolt going on. And it's language that is hearkening back to what we saw in the late 1970s and the 1980s, where there was a movement that was self-styled a property tax revolt. You saw this starting in California with Prop 13 with Howard Jarvis. You saw this spreading across the country, where there was really this significant discontent surrounding property taxes, the significant rise in assessed values, and the significant increase in property taxes associated with that. And there was significant pushback. Because of that, we saw lawmakers across the country respond with a variety of policy solutions to constrain the growth of property taxes or shift away from property taxes, at least in part, towards other taxes. They showed up in a lot of ways. It showed up in limits on how quickly the assessed value of your property could rise. It showed up in new taxes, uh, for instance, states like um, New Jersey or Connecticut adopting income taxes for the first time to provide a release valve so that they could reduce property taxes, which in, in some cases did not necessarily reduce the actual rates of property taxation. We saw a lot of efforts across the country, and we are seeing that, again, there's this tax revolt program. Um, we're seeing this in proposals for relief for existing incumbent homeowners. We're seeing this in proposals to actually actually just repeal the property tax outright. And we're seeing it, I think, for some understandable reasons, even though what you'll be hearing from my colleague Manish and I is that perhaps some of these more radical proposals are not the way to go, and there are better ways to provide much needed relief. But nonetheless, let's acknowledge where we stand right now. Property values, according to the Case-Shiller Index, are 46% higher than they were four years ago. Now, some of that is that every year, you know, properties, you know, you look at house sizes, they're getting larger. You know, some of this is just that, you know, in any given year, you're going to have more valuable properties than you have before. Some of this is also inflation and that being priced in. But to a significant degree, we all recognize that assessed values have risen dramatically in recent years. And if your property is valued at 50, 46% more, than it was four years ago, you probably do not believe that you're getting 46% more or better government, that something is wrong if your property taxes have risen commensurately. Now, many local jurisdictions around the country have responded to this. They've rolled back the millages, the rates, to ensure that not all of this was passed along as a tax increase. Perhaps none of it was, perhaps only a portion of it was. Maybe there was some growth factor. Nonetheless, for many taxpayers, they do rightly recognize that they are paying significantly more in property taxes than they did in previous years. You'll see some statistics later on from the census. Um, that unfortunately only goes through 2022, so it is actually in fact worse than those numbers will imply. But people are in many cases paying more. Um, this is not always the case. You'll see that actually nationwide, um, in real terms, in many cases, property taxes have gone down. But yeah, for those who have experienced significant increases, this is a very real, very active issue. And if you're seeing this, you want a legislative response. Now, many of you on the call recognize that in some ways this is a local issue, that generally speaking, local governments have control over their rates within certain constraints, that they could lower those millages, that these are local choices. But for those of you on the call who are 
legislators or legislative staffers, you also know that you are hearing from people who have very legitimate grievances, who are saying they want something done about property taxes, and they would like the state to do something about this. And there are certain tools in a toolkit that state legislators can use and have used over the years to try to address property tax increases. We're going to go through those. We're going to talk through some of the pros and cons of those, uh, some of the trade-offs associated with them. We're also going to make a case for you that the property tax is in itself a fairly good tax. This is something that is axiomatic among economists and very unpopular probably with most of your constituents, most of the people you serve. Uh, this, unfortunately, is probably why economists are not terribly popular. Uh, they tend to say things that almost no one who's not an economist quite agrees with. But there's a good case for this being a fairly neutral tax, a tax that doesn't get in the way of economic growth, that doesn't distort economic choices. My colleague Manish will go into more of that as we move forward with the call. That said, any tax, if it becomes too high, too aggressive, can become a bad tax. We want to find ways to address these legitimate concerns, ensure that property taxes are reasonable, that they're doing what they're supposed to do, uh, but that we are not eliminating a tax that we would argue has a very important place in the overall scheme of revenue, especially at the local level where 72% of local tax collections nationwide come from the property tax. And replacing that with anything else, in our view, would typically be worse than what we have now. So we want to go through this. We want to talk to you about the property tax. We uh, want to get your questions and provide you hopefully some options to address very real issues while recognizing the advantages that property taxes have compared to many of the alternatives that they could be replaced with. Um, with that, if uh, you know, we could go to the first slide, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Manish Bhatt, who is a senior policy analyst here at the Tax Foundation on our state team, and he's going to talk through a few of the features and the characteristics of the property tax. Thanks, Jared. It's, it's a real pleasure to be with you all. Uh, and as Jared said, the, the property tax is a fairly good tax, and you can read any number of studies on this. There's academic literature uh, that speaks to this issue, but I wanted to just focus on a few of the items that, that really stand out related to the property tax. So uh, first, uh, as Jared mentioned, it property tax is one of the few revenue generators that is available to local government. So removing it from their uh, from their ability to collect revenue really, really could be detrimental overall, not just to locality, but to the state uh, in general. The property tax, when we speak about it, we talk about it being transparent. And when I say transparent, I mean, people tend to know what they're paying in property taxes. I often joke that my wife and I got a chance to meet our neighbors, not over exchanging cookies or brownies, but by talking about the property tax um, in, in large groups and small. So uh, people do know what, they, what they're paying, whether they pay directly or uh, they're just reading their bills. Uh, in many jurisdictions, property owners have the ability to contest uh, what uh, their overall tax liability is for their property. Sometimes they're able to get it reduced. Uh, there, I've seen a lot of engagement between taxpayers and tax collectors, uh, usually hopefully in positive ways, but uh, very transparent tax. They know how much they're paying. They know how much they paid last year uh, in many cases. And so in that, from that sense, transparency really does exist uh, when it comes to property taxes. Also, property taxes tend to be relatively neutral uh, because when we talk about taxing real property, these assets are not movable. Uh, we don't see avoidance or competition activities as much as we might see uh, with uh, as they relate to other taxes. You know, income taxes can uh, discourage labor and investment at the margins. Uh, and other taxes, we talk about picking winners and losers in the market um, by disfavoring or favoring certain activities. Property taxes tend to have a smaller influence on, on economic decision making, and therefore they're generally more neutral. The tax, uh, the property tax, tends to comport with the public finance principle, sorry, the public finance benefit principle, which essentially says that taxes paid uh, should relate to the benefits received. And as we discussed earlier, property taxes are uh, the primary revenue generator for local government. And so their expenditures uh, can have a really positive effect on home values in, in, a given, in a given market. So as schools get better because of expenditures, it could, it could be that property values go up as well. And so in that sense, the property tax is generally self-reinforcing. Um, again, when it's, when it's crafted and tailored correctly. Uh, I'll pass it back off to Jared for the next slide. 
Yeah, and I'll just add a few comments on that. Transparency is a wonderful feature of taxation. I wish it were in more taxes. But when you have one tax that is quite transparent and it competes against others that are not, how much did you pay in sales tax last year? I doubt anyone on this call knows. Um, even income tax, a surprising number of people because most of their income tax is withheld would have trouble coming up even close to uh, what they paid in you know, state or local income taxes last year. But you know your property tax. So it becomes this source of frustration, how much you paid in property taxes compared to other taxes that may be more onerous, but you don't have that same feeling about them. So it's a burden associated with this tax for those of us who would say it has its place, but it's actually a good feature of the tax overall. <clears throat> and then when we talk about that benefit tax, that benefit principle, What's unique about local government compared to state and federal government is there's not, especially in, you know, without outside of a few major cities, not a lot of redistribution takes place at the local level. That tends to be more a federal and a state policy, um, which makes a lot of sense. If you are going to have a lot of aid, you're probably going to do welfare type assistance through those higher levels of government. What this means is that most of the services that local governments provide, not all, but most, have a fairly broad application. Those roads, police, fire, EMS services, um, the school system, they broadly affect those who own homes in the jurisdiction. And in fact, they tend to get capitalized into the value of that home, that uh, they make it a more attractive place to live. And therefore they have, like Manish said, this self-reinforcing effect that you are proportionally, at least roughly <clears throat> getting benefits um, in accordance with the value of your property. And then if we could go to the next slide, um, we'll talk about some of the ways that we've seen efforts to address this and some of the trends. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned that property taxes are about 72% of local tax revenue, and it varies across the country. Uh, in some jurisdictions, this is the only local tax. In other parts of the country, particularly the uh, South, both Southeast and Southwest, you tend to have local sales taxes as a more significant element as well but still very significant. I mentioned that we have census data through 2022 and we have uh, private sector data that goes through January, 2024. Nationally, census data, uh, we have housing values going up 33.6% uh, since uh, 2019. If we look at this from January, 2020 to uh, January, 2024 with the Case-Shiller index, we're seeing this at 46%. <clears throat> but what we're seeing during that census period is that people are paying 14.3% more in their median property tax bill, but that's actually 5.5% less than they paid if you make it in real terms, um, if you inflation adjust. So in many ways, inflation is the real culprit here. Um, and a lot of people actually are not paying more, but some are. And you have certainly jurisdictions throughout the country that have not responded to the higher assessed values. And if you live in one of those jurisdictions, it can truly seem extremely unfair. Uh, and there is, I think, a state role in addressing that. It's a question of how to do this in a way that is as neutral as possible, that isn't arbitrarily interfering in the market. And that matters in part because one of the fundamental reasons why property values are rising is housing availability. And this is a huge issue. Housing availability and housing affordability are really significant. And what we don't want to do is to create a situation where tax policy, while providing benefits to certain existing homeowners, is inadvertently interfering in the market for new homes or making it more difficult for people to move. So let's jump to the next slide and talk about some of the solutions that have been proposed and why some might be fairly good and some not so good. <laughs> so in almost every jurisdiction, there's some sort of homestead exemption. This is a preferential tax policy designed to help primary residences. It's essentially to distinguish between secondary residences, apartment complexes, commercial real estate, other real property. And because I saw a question um, on this in, in the q and I'll just clarify this now, that we're talking in this webinar about real property. We're talking, therefore, about land and structures, uh, mainly places where people live. Um, commercial property is obviously also real property, though um, most policymakers, I think when they're hearing from constituents, this is about residential real property. The That market is very hot. 
um, there's a softness, a real softness in the commercial real property market. There's tangible property out there too. That's a very different question. We have resources on that. Uh, there's not actually a very strong case for states or local governments taxing tangible personal property like machinery and equipment under a property tax, but most do. But we're talking here about real property. And most jurisdictions across the country provide a homestead exemption where some amount of a primary residence's assessed value is not subject to tax. This can be fairly small or it can be very large. <clears throat> in um, in Texas, it has been recently increased to one hundred thousand um, dollars. In uh, in Wyoming, there has been a proposal to create over two stages, essentially a million dollar exemption. Functionally, of course, that means that there would be almost no one paying property taxes. You'll have some Jackson homes um, that are subject to that, but functionally only commercial would be subject to tax. One important thing to remember when we are dramatically increasing the homestead exemption is where are we shifting it? You might think, oh, we're shifting it to just the higher earners, the you know wealthier individuals who own um, you know more expensive homes and might have higher millages. Um, now to compensate for this exemption uh, being higher, but you know they've, they've got the money to handle it. Um, <clears throat> but actually, there's two things here. One, there's commercial, uh, and we don't necessarily want to be too, um, you know, too heavily taxing commercial, especially since they often already face different assessment ratios where there's a split role and they are treated um, less advantageously than um, residential property. But also, this is your rental unit. Um, if you have more four or more rental units, then you're commercial property. And that means that your renters are, according to economic literature, typically bearing most of the incidence of a property tax on rental property. Sure, the landlord is paying it. Most of it is being passed along to the actual renter. And economically, we know that most renters are lower income and lower net worth than most homeowners. This is not universally true. There are obviously some renters of some very nice penthouse apartments in Manhattan, um, and this is true across the country. But typically speaking, if we are focusing on providing relief through homestead exemptions, we are shifting burdens, and we're shifting them sometimes towards the lower income you know, uh, residents of a community. We are shifting them towards uh, you know, a lot of small businesses. This isn't necessarily a very effective way to do property tax relief, and can, sometimes it can push towards higher millages. <clears throat> Another approach is tax swaps. And this comes in a variety of forms, but this is where the state government is essentially using its own revenue streams to typically provide some relief to localities so that they can reduce property taxes. Sometimes it involves the local government receiving money from the state government and then being forced or strongly encouraged to reduce their property taxes because of this. Sometimes it's directly to homeowners where you get some sort of credit or relief from the state directly. Um, frequently, however, you have a problem. There may be initial provisions that try to reduce the level of taxation at the local level that provide this relief in exchange for some reduction in the millage. Rarely, however, is it accompanied by the sort of controls that don't allow local governments to, over time, increase to back where they were or even higher. So functionally, it becomes a subsidy to local governments that may not substantially lower your lo local property taxes. Um, now there's just more revenue. There's more tax in the overall picture. You haven't really swapped state for local. You have simply increased both or at least uh, increased the state without a commensurate amount of decrease in the local. Even if you put the appropriate controls, and you can use levy limits for this, and it's one way to do this, and we'll talk about those in a minute, even if you have some controls to try to constrain that, you're shifting where the revenue comes from. So if you're shifting, say, from a local property tax to a state income tax, or if you're shifting authority within the local government where they can levy different types of taxes, like a local income tax, now you have competitiveness issues. You know, all taxes trade-offs, there are places for all of these taxes, but income taxes, as Manish mentioned, um, these are taxes that impact the return to labor, uh, the return to investment. They have more of an effect on migration. They have more of an effect on uh, capital investment. They have more of an effect on the, the labor market than do property taxes. So we're shifting from something that's relatively neutral to something that is less neutral and more economically distortionate. It doesn't mean there's not an important place in many states for income taxes. But we have these things in balance. 
And if you're eliminating this major source of local revenue entirely and shifting all of that into a state tax, um, you may find that it is less economically competitive than otherwise. And then I'm going to turn it over to Manish, Manish to talk about three other forms of relief that are offered, three types of limits that state governments can impose on localities to try to limit the way that property taxes grow over time. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about those limits. Before I get there, I wanted to just circle back really quickly to the homestead exemption. And as Jared mentioned, Texas and this $100,000 homestead exemption, and there are some additional homestead exemptions for, for disabled veterans and, and, other, and other individuals. It, it's important to note that this is a cautionary tale. There are a number of what Texas calls independent school districts, just school districts, uh, where the average home value is below $100,000, which which does hamper that ability to, to raise local revenue in those districts. So these homestead exemptions uh, can, if they're set too high, obviously there's distortionary, as Jared mentioned, but they, they really can have a significant impact. And just look at the case of Texas for that as a cautionary tale. So moving on to the limits. So there are three primary limits that I wanted to discuss today. The first is an assessment limit. Now, an assessment limit is really an attempt to keep people in their homes uh, so that they are not forced to sell or otherwise uh, get out of their house uh, because of a rise, a rise in uh, valuations. And we're seeing this the surge in valuations around the country. And uh, as a result, people are quite and I think appropriately so, uh, nervous about their property uh, tax liability. And so assessment limits are intended to limit the ability of valuation increases uh, or certainly to stop a sharp increase in a very short amount of time. Uh, and when we look at the options that legislatures are considering uh, regarding the, the surge in home values, uh, assessment limits seem really appealing. Uh, but the reality of, of them is that they're quite distortionary. The, one of the main uh, drawbacks of an assessment limit is that it creates what's known as a, a lock-in effect. Essentially, uh, it keeps people from looking for other homes, uh, maybe trading up and getting a bigger home when their family or their purchasing power increases. They'll stay in the same home to avoid triggering a new, a new assessment uh, and then obviously higher taxes on that. It discourages new home construction because new homes would come with a bigger tax price tag. It discourages uh, major home renovation projects. And so we find properties tend to age and not maybe not age as well as they could because a major home renovation would trigger a new property tax assessment. It also means that you could have uh, two substantially similar properties in the same neighborhood that are paying dramatically different property tax bills based solely on date of purchase. All of these things compound on each other. And what we end up seeing through assessment limits is that they really are uh, they're detrimental, not just to the homeowners themselves, but to younger families, younger individuals, lower income individuals that are seeking to maybe stop renting and, and purchase that the inventory becomes more scarce for, for these individuals. And so assessment limits do have some significant drawbacks, but I do want to recognize that when you're facing a surge in valuations, they're, they're, they seem tempting, uh, but I, it, it's really important to keep these, these detrimental effects of assessment limits in mind. The second is a rate limit and a rate limit is designed uh, really to keep legislatures from raising uh, property tax rates. And again, this too seems like a very reasonable and very effective way to limit property tax liability. But here again is an important caution. Rate limits do nothing to help protect or provide relief to property owners when they face a rise especially a dramatic rise in property valuations. So capping the rate does nothing to stop the valuation. We tend to think and believe that levy limits are the most effective property tax relief tool when they are shaped and crafted carefully. What a levy limit is, is it really is concerned with how much a local government can raise in revenue. It establishes rollbacks or reductions to ensure that local government revenue collections do not increase in the aggregate above a specified amount. 
importantly, an individual's tax liability may increase or decrease based on the rate or the assessed value, but in the aggregate, collections overall are constrained. Uh, these are the most neutral and effective ways to limit property tax growth uh, at property tax liability. And importantly, in, it's very often the case that levy limits, this collection limitation, is subject to voter override. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But it's important that if you have voted levies or voter override of levy limits, that the what's being voted on is transparent and clear, which is not always the case when uh, voters go to the ballot box. And that they should not be as easy to do. It should not be the consistent pattern year over year where voters are being asked to uh, override a levy limit to provide certain things for their community. Uh, and so, again, transparency is key. And as is the, um, the the frequency and the difficulty of getting these things before voters. So those two things are really important to keeping levy limits in check. One way that this has been done in a number of jurisdictions, and I think you'll see this more, is to combine levy limits with what are called truth and taxation laws. And this is just a mechanism to provide uh, homeowners with a little more information about what they're seeing, essentially, not just on the ballot, but generally, to have information about why their taxes are rising, um, what it would be under different scenarios, you know, had the uh, had, a, had the levy limit been in place, had it, you know, if it superseded, what would the difference be? Um, and to provide often some opportunity for public comment when there is going to be an increase. <laughs> but, you know, when there are levy limits and there are these voter overrides, we certainly see, you can look at the, uh, you know, the, the elections, you know, going back years in a lot of states that have these, voters not infrequently do choose to allow their jurisdictions to exceed the levy limit. And that can be a good thing. There can be good reasons for a government to want to collect additional revenue. But it's very valuable to have this check on that activity. If, again, you know, your assessed values have risen, let's say, 40 some percent, you know, it's very unlikely you're going to go to the voters and ask to retain all 40 some percent. That's probably not politically very viable. You, if you are not subject to a levy limit, might keep all of it because that's the status quo. That's the default. If you're going to the voters, you might ask for something more modest. You might ask to exceed what the limit would allow, but you'll probably make a better case. And I think that's key here. Uh, it's not my job, certainly, um, and it's not even necessarily a state legislator's job to say under what circumstances should local governments grow faster than some formula. Uh, that may be the local government's responsibility and the voters' responsibility, but providing a mechanism for feedback between the two rather than having this automatic ratchet where just the default is increases. So typically levy limits are going to have a couple of features. They're often going to incorporate inflation. They're often going to incorporate a growth factor that you can grow a certain percent above inflation. And they will almost always, and they should always include um, provision that says that the calculation is excluding new property placed into service. Because imagine that a community gets a new development, a thousand new properties. Well, you expect that you are going to need more property taxes. You need to expand maybe the road system. There needs to be more infrastructure. There needs to be uh, more seats in schools. So I mean, there's a lot of things that need to be provided when the community is growing. So if there's population change, if there's significant changes in the property itself, that's going to be outside of that cap. You wouldn't want that there. But within the properties that existed last year, if you've seen a dramatic increase in their value, then you're using that to calculate what does the levy have to be? And you're still allowing this float where the actual assessed value is the baseline for the calculation. Because, you know, if my property has increased in value by 20% in the last few years, and yours has only increased in value by 10%, it actually does make sense that my property taxes rise relative to yours, it may just not be that they need to rise by 20%. They might need to rise by some lower amount. So levy limits are a neutral way, um, a market sensitive way to deal with this. And we really do want to avoid as much market interference as possible. We don't want these sort of distortions. And governments make choices about intervention in the housing markets. And this isn't about that. You can have different views on what sort of interventions there may or may not appropriately be to provide for low-income housing, to provide housing supports. But what I can tell you is that at very least, you want to make sure you're designing towards a goal. 
And when you're using assessment limits, you're not designing towards any such goal. In fact, it would be probably the opposite of most of those goals, where, as Manish said, you're often shifting the cost to newer, younger, lower income homeowners. Um, you're often shifting you know, more of the cost towards racial minorities when you consider the you know, the patterns of housing ownership over time. I mean, think back to California and imagine the person who's had their property since the late 1970s and is paying next to nothing and the person who's buying their first home right now. And just sort of imagine the demographic change between the late 1970s and now and who's paying property taxes and who functionally isn't. So all of these things, even if you believe that there are some interventions that we need in the housing market to achieve certain goals, you almost certainly wouldn't achieve those with an assessment limit. You would certainly protect incumbent homeowners, but you do so at a significant cost. So again, among these, we see levy limits as the most appropriate way. And there's lots of models out there. We have some papers on this. Um, New York and Massachusetts have designed pretty good ones. Uh, I think those can be good models. Um, you know, we see these in red states and blue states alike. That's one thing where there's really not an obvious partisan lean in any of these things. You'll find assessment limits in California and in Florida. You'll find levy limits in Massachusetts and in you know Midwestern red states. Um, we think one's better than the other, but they don't really code right or left. Um, we do think that one codes far better, more efficient towards most of the policy aims that lawmakers across the spectrum are seeking. Uh, so that's certainly, we think, an option available, and the exact mechanism can vary. One thing you also want to keep in mind, and it doesn't necessarily matter very often, but it can matter, is um, making sure there's not a downward ratchet. So let's say that you know you, you have this levy limit, you only allow um, you know, the additional revenue from taxes to grow, let's call it inflation plus 2% or 2.5% in Massachusetts, for instance. Well, the question is, what's the baseline? Is it last year? Is it year over year? Or is it against the previous high? And that can make a real difference. Nevada would be a huge case in point in this. Nevada had one that was year over year. So if ever property values plummeted, then you would have a situation where even as they grew back, they could only grow back at, I think it was 2%, 2% per year. So, you know, imagine the housing bubble or imagine really, I mean, with the broader context of the Great Recession, it's not just that there's the generic housing bubble across the country, but also it's Nevada, it's Las Vegas. And what's the first thing that people are going to cut back on when the market sours and suddenly there's not discretionary income and businesses don't really want to be seen sending people somewhere? Well, they're not going to Las Vegas. And housing values in Nevada just crashed. And they came back. I mean, it didn't take very long for them to come back, but the way they had designed, it was actually sort of a, a mix. It was quasi-assessment limit, a little bit of levy limit element. It was, you know, there's a, several of these that are hybrids. It leaned a little more towards assessment limit. But, you know, both models, it applies here. Um, if you are not allowed to grow faster than some established amount to catch up, then you're gonna have a downward ratchet that creates a problem. But you design this right, you do it as a levy limit. I think this is probably one of the most responsible ways that you can address legitimate concerns about property taxes increasing on autopilot. And if we can then go to the next slide from there. Um, Let's talk a little about um, some of the uh, the ways, some of the states where this has gotten really aggressive. I'll have Manish talk through in brief um, five different states where there's been a discussion of actually eliminating or functionally eliminating the property tax. And then I'll take it a little deeper on one state, Nebraska. So we're so again, the opposition to the uh, to the property tax isn't new, uh, but we're starting to see a uh, an effort in several states to eliminate property taxes, Jared said, or significantly reduce the number of properties that are subject to the tax itself. Uh, and we're seeing this in Florida, Nebraska, North Dakota, Texas, Wyoming. Um, in Florida, th the situation is this, that the legislature is considering a bill to study the matter. Uh, Florida doesn't uh, tax individual income and uh, and so there's some questions about the feasibility of of removing the tax entirely, and the legislature is tracking forward with um, pursuing a study. 
I'm going to leave the um, epic uh, ballot initiative to Jared, but I will I will I will start by saying uh, it's currently a ballot initiative, uh, but the epic proposal uh, was also uh, introduced in the legislature and was was unable to to get an, a positive vote there. And now uh, the citizens of Nebraska, are, if it makes the ballot, are, will be asked to uh, consider eliminating the property tax. Uh, North Dakota, similarly seeing a citizens initiative, uh, again, hoping to get ballot access to remove the property tax. Uh, Texas uh, is uh, proposing that there have been bills in the past to, to eliminate the property tax, uh, but Texas is considering uh, over time using what's known as compression or uh, using state funds to buy down local rates uh, for, for property, buy down the millage. Uh, and over time, the intention would be uh, to eliminate the property tax entirely. Uh, Wyoming uh, is, con is considered uh, raising the sales tax to eliminate uh, the property tax on most residential homes. Again, it wouldn't affect uh, a lot of homes in my former home of Teton County and uh, so uh, I, I want to be really clear that it's on most residential, not all. Now, why are these uh, initiatives getting uh, traction in, in a variety of different states? Well, there is, again, this opposition to the property tax. We're seeing this valuation surge across the country, and we hear very similar rhetoric uh, around around the country on these issues. And we often hear people say that you shouldn't be forced, uh, once you purchase a property, you shouldn't be forced to effectively rent it back from the government by paying taxes. That's one argument that we hear we hear quite uh, quite frequently. Uh, this idea that you shouldn't have to pay taxes on something that you already bought and paid for it and, and should, should have paid a, t a tax on it at the time of purchase. We also um, see a significant concern uh, with people losing their properties or being subject to losing their properties for failing to pay the property tax. Uh, there's some support out there uh, among some to say that if you remove the property tax, what you will end up doing is benefiting not only homeowners, but you'll be, be you'll be benefiting renters. And the reason for that is when you pay a property tax on your commercial property, and if apartments are listed uh, as a commercial property or or a, a class of property uh, for which they're subject to the tax, that the the owner of that property is not going to pay it; they pass it along to the renters. And so this argument su suggests that you not only protect the homeowner but also the renter. Um, and again, this issue of valuations and appraisals that uh, thing around the country, valuations are rising and, and citizens are worried about losing their properties. Uh, and so these arguments tend to have uh, some traction in these areas. Now, in, in each of these states, Florida, Nebraska, North Dakota, Texas, Wyoming, there are local uh, areas of concern and local issues. But broadly speaking, those are sort of the arguments that we that we hear. Uh, and in Nebraska, uh, the, the, the arguments have been very public. So I'll turn it over to Jared. Thanks. And actually, um, I'm going to take a couple of questions here before I go to Nebraska. And I'm going to combine two, and I'm going to anonymize them a little um, because there were some local details. But one of the questions deals with a community, a jurisdiction that has seen a very significant increase in um, valuations because it's had just massive migration into it in recent years you know, relative to the rest of the state. And the state has some levy limits that are actually set statewide. Um, so essentially, levy limits aren't doing a whole lot there because the statewide average uh, rate of increase is not nearly as significant as the localized one. The other question was, um, is there a rationale for assessment limits that are relatively broad to deal with excessively high assessment increases that might seem fairly random and like a range of 50 to 150 percent was given? I'm going to try to address both of these in one answer, which is to clarify and to state that in some cases, all of these limits have been imposed at the state level but that is the inappropriate unit of government. Even though the state would be levying the, like in stating the inquire, requirement, the calculation should be done at the taxing jurisdiction, whether that's the county or school district, whatever that jurisdiction is that has the authority to tax, that is the appropriate jurisdiction at which to do the calculation. So if, you know, Manish mentioned uh, having previously lived in Teton County, not all of us can be so lucky as to live in such a beautiful place, but if you did, you are going to see, um, you know, probably much higher valuation increases than people elsewhere in the state. Um, the same would be true if you lived in, say, Boise compared to other parts of Idaho. Um, and you want the levy limit to be based on the 
valuation increases and the additional revenue that you'd be generating within that county, within that jurisdiction, and lowering it accordingly there. Not to be aggregating all of the state. Iowa is one that does sort of this aggregation of all the state. There's like several, it's another hybrid. But this hybrid doesn't take into account local characteristics. The compression, the levy reduction should be local, and that solves a lot of it. And that solves the really high assessed value increases as well, because most of those tend to be local pockets. Now, you're still, you know, sometimes you have an seemingly arbitrary increase in assessed value, where it's not just that your jurisdiction has much higher assessments, either because of methodology or because, you know, it's just growing faster, um, where levy limits would take care of this, but also just one house or, you know, for whatever reason, a few houses have absurd increases. Uh, there, an assessment limit really isn't the solution, probably an appeal is, and there are mechanisms for that, and there are reforms probably that could be done to make sure that we have greater equity in how assessments are done. Those are legitimate issues. But most of this can be solved by having your limitation at the jurisdictional level rather than having it statewide. I would encourage if whatever limits you have are currently done at the state level, think about um, devolving those so that the baseline for calculation is local and that will make them work a whole lot better. And with that, let's uh, talk about Nebraska's EPIC proposal. So if we can advance another slide, we'll take a look at it. <clears throat> Um, we actually have a recent publication on this. You, know, you can see on the you know, slide that we have the, the you know, publication there, and you can find it on our website. This is a really substantial proposal. As the name suggests, this is the um, Eliminate Property Income um, and Consumption Taxes, uh, and, and Corporate Taxes, rather, and replace them all with what's supposed to be a broad-based consumption tax. So it's supposed to eliminate the property tax, individual and corporate income taxes, the inheritance tax, the sort of an extra sub I, I guess, and the existing sales tax, and replace it with one theoretically broad-based tax on consumption. Now, public finance scholars and economists will tell you that there's a really good case for leaning more into taxes on consumption, that they are more economically efficient, that they're more neutral. Um, if we compare, say, an income tax to a well-designed consumption tax, the income tax is taxing both present and future consumption. So it's affecting investment decisions. It's affecting on the margin, your propensity to work. Um, you know, a lot of those important economic determinants. A consumption tax is more constrained. It's just the present consumption. And when you have both of these, of course, I wouldn't say it's pure double taxation, but at one level you're taxing you know, present and future consumption, and then you're taxing present consumption again. You're taxing to some degree a similar thing. So there is a case for more reliance on consumption taxes, and there are nine states that do not have an individual income tax, and some of them do really well under that model. But if this feels like a lot, repealing the property tax, basically all of your you know, local, uh, most of your local revenue, the uh, individual and in, you know, corporate income taxes, the inheritance tax, the current sales tax, and replacing them with one consumption tax, you're, you're right, it's a lot. And proponents are saying they're gonna replace it with a 7.5% broad-based consumption tax. And that would be incredible. If you could do that, that would be absolutely amazing. The only problem is you clearly, clearly cannot do that. Um, they call it a broad-based consumption tax. It's actually not incredibly broad-based. It exempts um, any um, health care provided through insurance, which is a lot of it, um, and presumably would actually become more because if you're doing anything out of pocket and that's subject to tax, you have an incentive to get more robust coverage to have less out of pocket. Um, you know, it doesn't indicate that it uh, doesn't tax, uh, it, it, in, it seems to indicate that it should tax government purchases of healthcare like Medicare, Medicaid, but you know, federally you can't do that. So you would not be taxing those things. Um, it does not tax private education services. It does not tax groceries, um, doesn't tax um, insurance services. Like I said, there's, you know, it's, it's a mixed base. It's broader, certainly on consumption than the current base, meaning, meaningfully broader, uh, but it's not, all consumption, and it couldn't be all consumption. Uh, we ran the numbers, excluding things that either legally the state could not tax or things that it said in the proposal that they would not tax, making an adjustment for the fact that proponents say they are going to tax um, government consumption, federal, which you can't do, legally you can't do, and state and local, which just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because you know if you are taxing yourself, no money is changing hands. Um, and if you need to raise the same amount of revenue and spend the same amount of expenditures, you're, you know, 
it's circular. Uh, you know, when we make these adjustments, we get a rate of 21.6%, not 7.5%. Now, if that seems really high, that's really high. Um, and that's state. Now, that's intended to replace the local property tax. So it's sort of state and quasi-local. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't replace the existing local sales tax, which the um, localities would be allowed to impose um, their own add-ons on this. So you're probably looking at, I don't know, 22 23% sales tax, and that's assuming that there isn't any avoidance activity. And let me tell you that at those rates, you're going to see more of that. Um, you're going to see cross-border shopping at a much higher rate if you live in, um, and forgive me, I think it's Douglas County, uh, where Omaha is, well, you're just a few miles from um, from Iowa. I would imagine you're going to see some people driving across the lines. And uh, you know, you're going to see a lot of changes in behavior based on this. So 22% is probably an underestimate. This is not realistic. And that is, I think, a driving theme of most of these proposals. They're simply not realistic. In North Dakota, the proposal out there is to just repeal, uh, just to eliminate the property tax and let the state find a way to make local governments whole if they want to. And right now, North Dakota is doing pretty well for itself. Um, revenues are high. Um, you know, you could make a case, I think, in snapshot that they could probably offset this, uh, whether you know, natural resource revenue, you know, severance tax revenue is going to be that high a few years from now. I think it's probably an open question. Um, it's also leaving to the state government, the, you know, the decision of what to transfer and how much and eliminating really any principle of fiscal federalism where local governments have any involvement in their own revenues um, and the responsibility that comes with that. Um, and again, probably not a very efficient use of that revenue. If you wanted to make more of an economic impact. There's certainly other things that you would probably want to cut before you looked at the property tax. But these things are, I think, somewhat emotionally driven. And we do get it. We understand the frustration with the property tax. We understand that sometimes that's philosophical. For some people, typically more on the right end of the political spectrum, there is this sense that it's just an unfair tax, that you're paying a tax on something you already own, and that makes you sort of like a renter from the government. I don't think that's the right framework, um, and I don't think that we are consistent if we apply it to the property tax and not to other things. Um, you know, do I owe my labor when I pay an income tax? Um, you know, you know, there's lots of things where you could say, you know, there's an ongoing tax obligation, but we do get it at some level. Um, we understand the frustration with property taxes. The case we're trying to make here is that this is a pretty good tax when it's done well. Um, that replacing it is very difficult to do. You don't want a 22% um, you know, consumption tax. Um, and that the appropriate response is to provide rational, neutral relief where appropriate. That means levy limits. It also does mean thinking about where you may have a need to help people who need it the most. Um, and that should be targeted. So when Manish talks about people being priced out of their homes, that's a very legitimate concern. No one wants that. Now, the problem when we say no one wants that is that this could mean a lot of different things. It could mean that someone living in a $5 million home finds that it's not really economically viable for them to continue living in a $5 million home now that they're empty nesters and don't need it as much and the property tax is a lot. And maybe that's not something we want the property tax to help them with. Uh, but on the flip side, there are people who have a fixed income, who live in a fairly modest home, and who may just find that because assessed values have risen dramatically, they would have to move out of the only home they've had for a really long time. And we understand that there can be a case for doing something about this. Um, there are narrow, targeted ways. Most states have what are called circuit breakers that provide relief for lower income, fixed income individuals, especially who live in fairly modest homes, you can target this to provide for those who have the greatest need with fewer distortions in the market. We don't actually want to encourage a lock-in effect. Um, you know, if an empty nester wants to live in a you know large house worth a lot, that is entirely their choice. And it is not the government's job to say no. But it's not necessarily the government's job to make it the best economic choice to say that if you choose to downsize, you're going to pay more in property taxes. And that's absolutely the case in a lot of states where you could see a substantially increased tax burden by downsizing. So you have a rising family that 
could really use that extra space that isn't getting it because that property is not turning over, even though someone would like to turn it over because the property tax is getting in the way that they're paying next to nothing now. And if they moved, they'd pay an awful lot. We don't want that. We want as neutral as possible within the property tax system that we have. But I would argue we want the property tax. We don't want something like we're seeing proposed in Nebraska or Florida or Texas or Pennsylvania or Wyoming or North Dakota. And some of these are sort of varying levels of you know, serious consideration. And I know there's people in this call um, who disagree with this, who have a philosophical opposition to the property tax, and I respect that. I understand that. I think that it's a tax that is very much part of the system we have in the United States that is worth preserving, um, at least under the current system, that it is better than a lot of the alternatives that we have, and that the focus should be on making sure that it is a continually well-functioning tax, and that it isn't arbitrary, uh, that it isn't overly burdening people as it has been um, in recent years in some jurisdictions. Um, I think with that, um, maybe I'm going to see if I can answer a few more questions and Manish can jump in on some of these too. But if you haven't asked a question yet and you want to get them in, I would encourage you to ask them now in the window. I see one asking what other avenues there might be, particularly asking about um, land value taxes or split rate. And let's distinguish this from something called split roll. Split roll is where you have different assessed um, assessment ratios on different classes of property. So for instance, you're applying functionally a higher rate on commercial property than you are on residential property or on industrial property or something like this. Um, you know, but this idea, the land value tax, or the way it's actually been done on a very limited basis in Pittsburgh and is proposed in Detroit and DC, would be to have more of the tax fall on property, the land itself, and, and less on the structure. Uh, the idea here, well, two, a few things. I mean, some of it goes back to a, something called Georgism, um, the philosophy of Henry George, this idea that um, you know, land is a scarce resource and that when you are using land, you're denying it to someone else, obviously true, and that it is very valuable and that you should be paying some sort of rents for your exclusive use of it um, and that we don't want land to go underutilized. So tax the land more than the structure because we, we want to encourage the building. Um, we want to encourage the you know best use of the land. Um, I think it's an interesting idea. I think there's good arguments for it. Um, our friends at the uh, Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, um, this is one of their reasons for existing is to make this argument. They do a lot of other great work on property taxes, whether you agree with them on that or not. I certainly recommend them as a great resource on property tax issues. Um, I think there's a case for this, especially in jurisdictions where there's concern about blight and underutilization of property that shifting more of the burden towards properties that are essentially underutilized and make encouraging their use can make sense, but it's a big shift. And I understand that that may not be where a lot of jurisdictions are going right now, but it is certainly an idea that can be considered. I see another question about um, uniform application versus discriminatory application of property. So basically that um, split role that I talked about. You know, our view would be, again, that you do not want to discriminate in uses of the of the property of tax, um, that you should have the same assessment ratios and same treatment of commercial property or residential property. And especially when you consider that rental units are typically, like apartments will be commercial property and most of that gets passed along. It's really hard, I think, to make a good case that commercial property should be paying uh, a higher effective rate, um, given that it's not just that you're hitting businesses harder, but you're also hitting a lot of people in residential units harder who often are going to be lower income. It's, I think, a, a distortive way of taxing property and one that jurisdictions should try to get away from. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, a number of questions coming in and it takes me a minute to read them. Um, there's, some questions about school financing. I don't know if I can get into all of those, but I will at least mention that um, often property taxes can be levied by multiple jurisdictions. They can be levied by the 
you know, county government, city government, um, school district, sometimes many other jurisdictions. And this can be a challenge when you have many, many different layers of jurisdictions that can impose separate levies and millages. Um, and especially if you're using some sort of property tax limitation, like a levy limit or even an assessment limit, which is you know, not our preference, but whatever it is, um, sometimes those limits apply against some of the taxing jurisdictions, but not others. Or they apply in ways that don't really do a good job of capturing overall increases um, because of the way that these are fractured across all of that. So you probably want this certainly unified for your levy limit purposes, but even though it may not be easy to do, it actually does make sense to the degree possible to have fewer taxing jurisdictions on your property um, yeah, and yeah, not have too many of them. Uh, let's see here. Um, there's a question about is it problematic, essentially, that there's an expansion of tax abatements and tax increment financing for commercial um, and, and development property and shifting tax burdens to residential? It's a really good question. So most of the time, even where there's significant use of tax increment financing, I don't think you'd find that it's shifting a lot to residential property. Um, what it is usually doing is functioning as a patch or a Band-Aid for really high innate taxation of commercial property. Iowa is a classic example of this. Almost all commercial property, as far as I can tell, in Iowa is in a TIF because they're terrible with commercial property. They have rollbacks for residential and they're really different for commercial. So commercial is just taxed at many, many multiples sometimes of what residential is. Um, you know, some other states are really bad at this where like in Colorado, I think um, commercial is taxed at six times what residential is. And of course, this doesn't work. That's too high. So you know, jurisdictions find ways to address it. They'll say, you can get in this tax and grant financing district. We'll provide you some abatements. We'll provide you some relief. We'll allow you to effectively pay some taxes to yourself. We'll find ways that you're not really paying that. But of course, it's a lot of work to get what should be the treatment that everyone gets. And then not everyone gets it. And especially if you are potentially a new business and you don't have the political clout or the acumen or don't know that this is available and you're running those numbers, it can look really bleak. Um, so this is non-neutral. It can be fairly arbitrary. It can be politically designed or motivated where some are, you know, find it available to them and some don't. Uh, if you have a really bad treatment of commercial property, then eliminating all your tips without doing anything about that might create some incredibly high rates. That's probably not a good idea. But if you have a system of incredibly high rates and then somewhat arbitrarily and capriciously finding ways to lower it for everyone. I would suggest there's a kind of obvious way to address this over time to have a, a better system. Um, let's see. I don't know if, um, Manish, if there's uh, anything in here that you wanted to address as we wrap this up, but I think we, uh, you know, we have some really good questions here and we may not be able to get to all of them. Um, I know, I know we just hit three o'clock. I just want to hit two and I'll put them together. So there was a question about uh, how states are paying for homestead exemptions and it, it can vary around the country. I'll give you the example of, of Texas. Uh, Texas has been in a really strong position over the last several years and has been using state funds to buy down local millages. And but again, I think I mentioned that it's called compression. And then whether or not homestead exemptions apply to rental properties. Well, it's very often the case that homestead exemptions apply uh, to the home that you live in, to your residential property. But we're also facing these, um, while all these conversations are happening, we're seeing housing shortages in some really uh, interesting parts of the country. And so states are considering uh, extending homestead exemptions to non, um, to, to homes that are owned but rented out to, uh, to others. And with that, we know it's uh, past three o'clock. We thank everyone for your time. We are going to make this recording available and we'll also make the slides available and we are also available to you. So if you have any questions that we were unable to answer or did not completely answer, or you just didn't have time to put it in or want to talk to us separately, please reach out to me or Manish or really anyone on our team. We'd love to talk with you. We see it as a significant part of our mission to work with uh, lawmakers and their staff and people in the policy community. If you have questions, if we can be a resource, we really want to be. Uh, but this uh, recording will also be available. So if you know someone who missed it, um, it will be available soon. We'd love if you'd share it. Thank you for spending an hour with us today. We know your time is valuable. And uh, you know we look forward to talking with you all again soon. Have a great day.